Section 19 of The Outline of Science, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Applied Science, Chapter 2 Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony. Remarkable progress has been made in recent years in wireless telegraphy and wireless telephony, a new department of applied science, which has already produced astonishing results. Wireless messages are flashed over great distances with the speed of light, across land and sea, from continent to continent. As one writer has picturesquely put it, Quote, the whole of our planet is now converted into one vast auditorium through which human speech can be transmitted by wireless telephony. End quote. Articulate speech can be transmitted across the Atlantic. The traveler on a great liner, far out on the ocean, can listen in a comfortable easy chair to a concert going on in far off Paris, London, or New York. The aviator, thousands of feet high in the air, lost in the clouds or in a thick fog it may be, can receive help and direction by wireless messages, for it is quite possible to carry on conversation between the pilot of an aeroplane in the clouds and a wireless operator at a land station. Wireless direction finding is destined to be of great service in guiding aviators safely to their destination. There are, it is said, one million private people receiving wireless messages in America. This number had grown from 600,000 in the course of one year. Quote, there is transmitting at all hours of the day, we read. News of topical interest is flashing all the time. City men get their stock exchange quotations. Women the current prices from various shops. Sporting and holiday-bound people weather prospects. End quote. The broadcasting of news has reached such great dimensions that restrictions of some kind are likely to be imposed. In present conditions, some limit is necessary for the use of the radio telephone communication between single individuals. Wireless telephony is used primarily for broadcasting news, conveying commercial information, and for providing general entertainment. At present, the Marconi Company broadcast a concert once a week. The wireless amateurs receiving messages in Great Britain number something like 8,000. In their homes, they can enjoy the music broadcasted from distant concert rooms or amuse themselves by communicating with friends who may have transmitting sets or by tapping wireless messages from unknown sources. Today, anyone by making a request at any postal telegraph office in Great Britain, may have a message transmitted by wireless to a passenger on board an ocean liner in mid-ocean. It may be that one day every passenger train will be equipped with wireless apparatus. Such an experiment has been already made by the American Marconi Company, and communication maintained with the train over the whole course of its journey and it was traveling at times at the rate of sixty miles an hour. Sixty miles an hour is very slow compared with an aeroplane flying at two hundred miles an hour and picking up wireless messages. But how inconceivably slow are both compared with the speed of electromagnetic waves propagating wireless messages at the speed of 186,000 miles a second. This is the speed of light. It is also the speed of electromagnetic waves, a fact which gives rise to interesting speculations. Wireless has made travel by sea safer than it ever was. It would probably be well within the mark, it is estimated, to say that at least 5,000 persons owed their rescue from death by drowning to wireless even before the Great War in 1914. How many more were saved? during the enemy's submarine attacks on merchant vessels, it is impossible to say. In innumerable ways during the war, wireless was used with striking effect, from the small transmitting and receiving wireless sets, packed in boxes not more than 18 inches overall, 
used in the trenches to transmit messages to a base behind the lines, to the contrivances employed to enable ships to find their way through hidden dangers. The ship to be guided is provided with two coils of insulated wire, placed one on the port and the other on the starboard side, below the water line. If a telephone is inserted in each of these coils, sounds will be heard in it as long as the ship steers along and near to the cable. If the ship deviates from this course, the sounds become fainter or vanish in one or both telephones. Hence a ship can by this means feel its way along the cable, into a harbor or up a river, even at night or in a fog or through a minefield. Lieutenant Colonel Slaughter of the United States Army has described how, immediately following the declaration of war by America, orders were issued for an aeroplane wireless telephone set to furnish telephone communication between different aeroplanes of a squadron. In May 1918, quote, groups of aeroplanes using the wireless telephone sets were being drilled in the evolutions which the equipment made possible. In June 1918, a squadron of 39 aeroplanes, equipped with wireless telephone sets, went through a course of drill in the air in such a manner as to demonstrate the remarkable possibilities of a voice-commanded squadron. End quote. Subsequently, the training of aviators progressed at a rapidly increasing rate, quote, so that at the time of the signing of the armistice, many thousands of flights had been made. The record of these flights is a glowing tribute to the efficiency of the design of the wireless telephone set, which performed in such a manner as to give far less trouble than the aeroplane engine. End quote. We have referred to the number of lives saved by means of wireless messages, and the increased safety it affords to travelers by sea. Today it is unlikely that a disaster of such magnitude as the loss of the Titanic in 1912, with over 1,500 lives, could take place. Even then, 711 passengers in the ill-fated liner owed their lives to wireless, but had that unfortunate maiden voyage been made today, probably the great liner would have received timely warning of her danger. Cruising about in the North Atlantic, there is now an ice patrol on the lookout for icebergs, the exact position and size of which is broadcasted to all ships in these northern waters twice a day or oftener. The expense of maintaining this patrol is borne proportionally by all the maritime nations using the Atlantic. In connection with the warnings which wireless gives of the presence of icebergs in a particular place, it is interesting to note that it is to electricity also we owe the detection of icebergs. It is not always the case that the temperature of the water indicates the presence of an iceberg. The temperature test is not always reliable. Icebergs, which are broken off ends of glaciers, are formed from fresh water and affect the salinity or saltness of the sea water around them. The salinometer is an apparatus which applies an electrical test for detecting differences in the salinity of sea water. All over the world there are to be found a vast number of land wireless stations. Some are coast stations for intercommunication with ships at sea. Others are very high-powered radio stations for long-distance transmission. There is a station, for example, at Lyon in France, for communication with North Africa, and it is of such high power that it is capable of reaching as far as Indochina, which is 5,000 miles away. It was a great feat when the first wireless signals were transmitted across the Atlantic. The first official messages crossed the Atlantic on December 16, 1902, the signals being sent from the station at Poldhu in England to Glace Bay in Canada. Twenty years later, we find the world covered with gigantic power stations for transmitting half round the world electromagnetic waves of immense energy for telegraphic purposes, employing thousands of horsepower and exhibiting in every part the results of immense scientific thought and invention, the outcome of very costly experiments by numerous talented radio engineers and experts. 
Thirty years ago, the ether round the earth was undisturbed, except by short-wave disturbances which affect our senses, as light and heat. Now it is everywhere traversed by long waves or billows, which are the waves employed in wireless telegraphy. The Marconi Company have three large stations, at Poldhu in Cornwall, Clifton in Ireland, and at Carnarvon. The last communicates with a station in New Jersey in the United States. One of the high-power stations in Paris is at the Eiffel Tower. The tower itself, 1,000 feet high, is used to support the aerial wires. It is conceivable that in due time we shall see improvements in directive radiation, which will cause the greater part of the waves radiated from a wireless station to follow a particular path rather than to spread broadcast as at present. The application of wireless telephony to long-distance transmission on a greater scale than is at present practicable is certain. There is at present in existence suitable apparatus for a reliable service between such points as London and New York. Economic questions stand in the way of effecting a regular commercial service, but we are told that it is entirely conceivable that improvements in the art may soon bring the cost of such a system well within the limits imposed by economic considerations. Section 1. Wireless telegraphy is not one of those sudden discoveries, almost unrelated to the scientific knowledge of its time, which have sometimes almost revolutionized science. It is due, in the first instance, to purely scientific work. Radium was discovered in an almost accidental fashion, but the way for the discoveries in wireless had been carefully prepared. The pioneers were men like James Clerk Maxwell and Heinrich Hertz, who were so successful in investigating the powers and properties of electric currents and magnets. The foundation on which wireless telegraphy is built is electromagnetic waves. In order to understand the principles of wireless telegraphy, it is necessary to follow the thought and discovery on which the whole enterprise is based. It is necessary for us, in fact, to become acquainted with one of the greatest and most fundamental branches of modern physics, the science of electromagnetic radiation. The essential characteristic of the theory on which wireless telegraphy is based may be put as follows. It directed attention not so much to electrified bodies themselves as to the space surrounding them. That is to say, that in the case of an electric current flowing along a wire, for instance, the theory dealt not with the wire, but with the space surrounding the wire. The wire itself is in a peculiar condition, but so is the space about it. This fact, that the space about a wire conveying an electric current has just as remarkable properties as the wire itself, was first completely demonstrated by James Clerk Maxwell and it is from his epic-making work that the whole of wireless telegraphy springs. Let us consider this theory, not quite in the form in which Maxwell presented it, but from the point of view of the modern electron theory. We know that an electric current may be considered as a flow of electrons, and we know that the electron is the ultimate tiny particle of negative electricity now radiating out from any body charged with electricity are lines of force the magnetic force which exists in circles round an electrified wire is caused by the electric current the movement or flow of electrons creates a magnetic field as it is called round the path it is supposed that all magnetism is produced in this way we have seen what lines of force are in the case of a magnet. The electric lines of force which radiate from any electrified body radiate similarly to those of a magnet. We can picture these lines of force to ourselves as strings stretched out into space. If these lines of force from one electrified body fall on another electrified body, the tension in the strings 
tends to draw the bodies together. We say the bodies attract one another, but where the lines of force from one electrified body end on another, we always find that these two bodies are charged with different kinds of electricity. If one is charged with positive electricity, the other is charged with negative electricity. In this case, as we have said, the two bodies attract one another. When either a positive or a negative charge is produced, an opposite charge is produced also. But suppose both bodies are charged with the same kind of electricity, that is, they are both positive or both negative. Then, as very simple experiments show, they repel one another. The lines of force repel one another. We therefore see that in studying an electrified body, we have also to study the imaginary lines of force which radiate out from it into the surrounding space. If we imagine a single electrified body, say an electron, to exist in empty space, then each line of force from the electron stretches out to an infinite distance. The space surrounding the body is said to constitute the electric field of the body. It is only quite close to the body, however, that this field is of appreciable strength. Now suppose that our electrified body, say a single electron, begins to move, and a current of electricity is simply electrons in motion. What happens? In the immediate neighborhood of the electron, its lines of force are carried with it. But the lines of force do not behave as if they were rigid spokes. The movement of the electron is not communicated along the whole length of the lines of force simultaneously. The lines of force require time to adjust themselves to the new conditions. We can picture to ourselves a kink, due to the motion of the electron, traveling out along the lines of force. Now the startling discovery was made that the velocity at which this kink travels is the velocity of light. This traveling kink constitutes an electrical wave. The kink also produces a magnetic force. For this reason the wave is called an electromagnetic wave. It is a double system of lines of magnetic and electric force moving onward as we have described. These electric waves form the foundation of wireless telegraphy. These waves are sometimes described as ether waves, which are propagated more or less in all directions. As we have said elsewhere, there is less justification than formerly for assuming the existence of the ether. It is merely a hypothesis, and no observations have so far enabled the physicist to determine finally that ether exists. Some maintain its existence, Others have abandoned the hypothesis. The former maintain that ether is a universally diffused medium, and that it forms from the connecting link by which forces, like radiant energy, are transmitted across space. It is assumed that light and heat rays are propagated by ether vibrations. Other physicists conceive that a great part in the transmission of energy is played by corpuscular radiators, the corpuscles being the electrons we have spoken of. Sir William Bragg says, quote, It seems that we must admit the importance of each view, and to a certain extent we can accurately define the part that each must play. End quote. We need not, for the purpose of explaining our subject, Consider the relations between the energy carried by ether waves and the energy carried by electrons. There are distinctive features of each of these two forms of radiation, and they may have some extraordinary connection which has not been explained. Every time an electron changes its motion, it sends out the electromagnetic waves. In the case of the electrons shot out in a Crookes tube, for instance, their sudden stoppage by the walls of the tube, or by a plate put in their path, produces those very short electromagnetic waves we call X-rays. Now, if we can cause a large number of electrons all to charge their motion in the same way, the effects due to each will unite to produce a powerful electromagnetic wave. 
such a wave could be detected by suitable electrical appliances at a considerable distance and may be converted into visible or audible signals this is the principle of wireless telegraphy and we see that the first important requisite is to find some way of causing a number of electrons to oscillate together and thus initiate electric waves very rapid oscillations can be produced by the contrivance called the Leyden jar the Leyden jar is an electrical condenser by means of which electrical energy can be stored the Leyden jar consists essentially of a glass bottle coated part of the way up both inside and out with tinfoil if now the inner coating be charged with electricity it induces a charge of the opposite kind on the outer coating the glass separating the two pieces of tinfoil is thus put into a state of electrical strain the tinfoil acts as a means of evenly distributing the charge over the surface of the glass if the jar be left like this it will preserve its two charges for a considerable time but if the two coats be externally connected by a wire or the human body or by any other conductor of electricity a very rapid rush of electrons takes place through the conductor from one coating to the other but this rush of electrons is so impetuous as to overshoot the mark the energy stored in the jar acts as a bent steel spring which is suddenly released it flies past the point of equilibrium and has to return it may have to perform several oscillations before it finally comes to rest when in the case of the Leyden jar the electrons are equally distributed between the two coatings the jar is then said to be discharged in order to discharge the jar it is not necessary that the two metallic coatings should be actually connected a wire may be connected to each coating and the external ends of the wires connected to two metal knobs when now the laden jar is charged if the knobs are brought near to each other a spark will leap across the interval between them the tension set up by the different electricities of the jar is so great that it will force the electrons across the air gap but from what we have said we see that this spark will not consist of a single leap of electrons they leap back and forth several times before coming to rest the spark therefore really consists of a number of sparks each one the result of a leap of electrons these separate sparks have actually been made visible by employing a rapidly revolving mirror a single spark would give just one streak of light in the mirror a long steady spark would give a band of light but the separate sparks of the Leyden jar give a series of bright images separated by dark intervals now we have seen that the oscillations produced by the Leyden jar gradually die away oscillations which grow smaller and smaller are said to be damped there are also oscillations which do not die away but which remain of the same strength the whole time such oscillations are said to be undamped and they travel far these oscillations are dealt with later the difference between these sorts of oscillations is of great importance in wireless telegraphy section two we are now in a position to understand the principles of the transmission of wireless telegraph waves in the first place a laden jar is continuously charged by suitable apparatus and allowed to discharge itself through a circuit consisting of a coil of wire and a spark gap as we have seen oscillations will be set up in the circuit it was one of the most celebrated discoveries of faraday that whenever a current of electricity varies in one of two adjacent coils of wire a varying electric current is set up in the other coil due to the electromagnetic lines of force therefore if we bring a second coil near the first coil oscillations will be set up in the second coil one end of the second coil is connected to earth 
and the other end is connected to what is called the antenna or aerial, thus completing the transmitting circuit. At one end the current is led to the earth, at the other it is radiated into space. The aerial consists, in its simplest form, of a length of copper wire suspended by some insulating material from the top of a mast. As the oscillations are transferred from the first to the second coil, they cause a very rapid to and fro movement of electrons to flow along the aerial wire. We have seen that each electron in changing its motion generates a tiny electromagnetic wave. The movements of all the electrons in the antenna produce, therefore, an immense multitude of little waves which combine together to make a big one. This wave radiates out from the aerial with the speed of light, that is, at about 186,000 miles per second. The wave is really a wave of electric and magnetic force and these two forces act in directions at right angles to one another. Both these forces, moreover, are at right angles to the directions of the advancing waves. The transmitting apparatus in the operating room consists essentially of first apparatus for charging the laden jar, which may be either an induction coil and batteries to work it, or a motor generator which produces an alternating current. This current is transformed to one of a very high voltage or pressure by means of a step-up transformer, as a high voltage current is essential to satisfactorily charge a condenser. A switch or key is provided to make or break this charging circuit. Secondly, we have the condenser for storing electricity, which may be either in the form of a Leyden jar or jars, or in the form of plate glass, with the tinfoil coatings on either side. Thirdly, there are two coils of wire in close proximity to each other. Sometimes these coils, instead of being made of wire, are made of long metal strips. These coils are the coils used to transfer the oscillations to the aerial circuit. There is also another coil of wire which is used to tune the apparatus. Tuning is explained fully later. Then there is the spark gap, of which there are many different kinds, the simplest being two metal knobs fixed very near to one another. This type is known as the plane discharger. In some makes, the instruments are in cases. In other makes, the instruments are left quite open. If the operator wants to send a message, after first seeing that his apparatus is correctly tuned, he starts up the motor generator, if the charging apparatus consists of a motor generator and transformer. Now, if everything is correctly connected, he can, by depressing the key, which completes the charging circuit, cause the condenser to be charged and discharged very rapidly, thereby producing the oscillations which are transferred to the aerial and radiated in the forms of waves. If the key is depressed for a long period, a long train of waves is radiated, but if the key is depressed for a short period only, a short train of waves will be radiated. This division into shorter and longer trains of waves is sufficient for intelligible signaling. The Morse code, consisting of an arrangement of dots and dashes, is universally used for this purpose. The dots correspond, of course, to a short train of waves and the dashes to the longer trains. By combining these short and long trains, therefore, in the same way as dots and dashes are combined in the Morse code, messages can be sent as an ordinary telegraphy. We must now consider how the waves sent out are received at a distant station. When a wire is made to cut across the magnetic lines of force, an electric current is induced in the wire. It is also true that when the magnetic lines of force cut across the wire, they induce an electric current in it. Now we have seen that the waves sent out by the aerial are waves of electric and magnetic force. 
If, therefore, these waves strike across a wire in their path, they will induce currents in the wire. The oscillating currents so induced will be much feebler, however, than the original oscillations in the transmitting aerial. In the receiving circuit, there must be some apparatus for making these feeble incoming oscillations perceptible. The apparatus now employed is a telephone receiver. However, if these very rapid oscillating currents were to be passed direct through the telephone, it would not operate, as the currents pass too rapidly, first in one direction and then in the other, to produce any resultant effect. For this reason, an electric valve must be included in the receiving circuit. That is to say, some device which enables the current to pass in one direction, but not in the other. There are several such devices. A well-known one is the crystal rectifier. Many kinds of crystal can be used, some of the better known being carborundum, zincite, iron, pyrites, and bornite. These crystals have the peculiar property of allowing electric currents to flow through them more easily in one direction than in the other. If one of these crystals be connected up to the telephone, therefore, the oscillations arriving at the receiving aerial are, as it were, weeded out, so that only those currents which flow in one direction are allowed to pass. A train of waves mounts up and produces a click in the telephone. A short series of these trains produces a short musical note. A longer series of trains produces a longer note. In this way, the receiving operator can hear the dot and dash signals sent from the transmitting station, and consequently can receive intelligible messages. We have seen that an essential part of the receiving apparatus is an electric valve, a device for enabling the received current to flow in one direction, but not in the other. The most important and most extensively employed of these valves, the thermionic valve, has revolutionized wireless telegraphy of late. This valve takes advantage of the fact that electrons are emitted from a hot filament. We shall describe this valve in its simplest form. Inside an ordinary electric light bulb, there is a metal cylinder surrounding the filament, but nowhere touching it. Now let us see what happens when the filament is heated. A number of electrons escape from the surface of the filament. In the ordinary way, they would simply fall back on it. But if the surrounding metal cylinder is positively charged, it will attract the negatively charged electrons, and they will pass over to it, and can therefore be led to flow through a circuit connected to the cylinder. The current can only flow one way, namely, from the hot filament to the cold metal cylinder, since the cylinder itself is not giving off electrons. Such is the simplest principle of this form of valve or detector, and owing to its sensitiveness and its ease of adjustment, it is now, in one form or another, replacing all other types of valves. If this thermionic valve is connected up to the telephone in the place of the crystal rectifier, it will operate in exactly the same way. The future of wireless telegraphy and telephony is full of promise. Quote, the matter of greatest interest at the present time, says Professor J. A. Fleming, is the remarkable developments which have taken place in the thermionic valve, both as generator, detector, and amplifier of electric oscillations. We are only at the very beginning of this evolution, yet it has already completely revolutionized the practical side of wireless telegraphy, as well as telephony, with and without wires. End quote. Section 3. The waves used in wireless telegraphy vary in length according to the purpose they are to serve. Thus, for ordinary ship work, communications between ship and ship, or between ship and shore, the wavelength used is round about 2,000 feet. 
Now, an electromagnetic wave travels about 1,000 million feet in a second, so that the time difference between the front and back of a wave 2,000 feet long is only 1 500,000 of a second. This, therefore, is the time taken by one complete electric oscillation in the aerial. The electrons, to produce these waves, must oscillate 500,000 times per second. For long-distance wireless telegraph stations, much longer waves are employed. They may be anything between 6,000 and 20,000 feet. The oscillations necessary to produce them are correspondingly slower. Waves 20,000 feet in length, for instance, only require 50,000 oscillations per second. We have seen that every wireless telegraph circuit is essentially a collection of apparatus in which regular electric oscillations can be set up. Now every such circuit has what can be called its natural period of vibration. That is to say, there is a certain rapidity of oscillation to which it most readily responds. If we think of a heavy ball suspended by a string, we know that we can make this ball execute large swings by a number of light taps, provided these regularly succeeded one another at a certain definite rate. Much heavier taps, if performed irregularly, will produce much less resultant effect on the ball. If we make the experiment, we shall find that the period of the taps necessary to produce the maximum effect depends on the length of the string. Everybody who has swung himself in a swing makes use of the same principle. It is for the same reason that soldiers are made to break step in crossing a bridge. For if the slight shocks given to the bridge by their tramping feet are in the natural period of the bridge, they may set up such violent oscillations as to break the bridge. Now, by varying certain apparatus in an electrical circuit, we can alter its natural period of vibration, just as by altering the length of the string we can alter the period of vibration of the heavy ball. The receiving circuit of a wireless telegraph set when so adjusted to the oscillations it receives as to show its maximum response to them, is said to be tuned to them. When waves come through regularly, we hear a musical note, shrill, high-pitched, or low-pitched, the pitch depending on the number of arriving waves. The tuning can be adjusted, just as the string of a violin, by being tightened or loosened, raises or lowers its pitch. In radio, pitch is a matter of wavelength. Different sending stations send out oscillations of different periods, so that a receiving circuit which is tuned to one need not be tuned to the others. In this way, the sending station that is to be responded to can be selected from all the others which may be sending out waves at the same time and a certain amount of privacy can be ensured in this way by previous agreement as to the period of the oscillations which are to be used. The receiving instrument is adjusted to receive waves of the length transmitted just as a violinist tunes his violin to the pitch of an accompanying piano. Section 4. Wireless Telephony The principle on which wireless telephony is based will be easily understood by anyone who has followed the account given here of wireless telegraphy. Sound, as we know, consists of airwaves, and those waves take the form of a to and fro movement of the particles of air. Now, when we speak into an ordinary telephone, the airwaves set up by our voice causes a thin plate, the diaphragm, to follow the air movements. It bends in and out, in a manner corresponding to the to and fro motion of the air. Behind the diaphragm a number of little carbon granules are packed and, as the diaphragm moves, these granules are more or less compressed together. Now such an arrangement of carbon granules is a conductor of electricity. 
but its electrical conductivity varies according to the degree the granules are compressed together. A current flowing through the granules varies in strength, therefore, according to the movement of the diaphragm, that is, according to the air waves being set up by the speaker's voice. This varying current is conveyed along a wire and made to operate a diaphragm at the other end, producing similar air waves to the original ones, and thus reproducing, very nearly, the words spoken at the other end. In wireless telephony, we dispense with a connecting wire. The sending station sends out trains of undamped waves, which are continuous waves of constant amplitude. These would not, by themselves, affect the receiving telephone, since the oscillations used are too rapid. But by incorporating a telephone transmitter in the sending circuit, and making the oscillations first flow through this, we can, by speaking into the transmitter, vary the strength of the oscillations sent out in just the same manner as we vary the strength of the current in the ordinary wire telephone circuit. With waves as regular as any electric current in a wire modulation becomes possible and conforms with the inflections of the human voice. The waves sent out, therefore, are modified in strength by the speaking voice, and it is these modified waves that reach the receiving station to operate on the receiving telephone as in the case of ordinary wire transmission. The chief difficulty in practice is in the construction of the telephone transmitter, for it has to pass a much larger current than is used in wire telephones. The ordinary transmitter would become overheated and useless, but there are various devices for overcoming this difficulty, such as combining a number of transmitters and keeping them cooled by water. As Sir Oliver Lodge says, wireless telephony is a far more astonishing feat than the transmission of coarse signals like the dot and dash of telegraphy, the sending of impulses across space by a mechanical relay. He says, quote, But no mechanical relay could follow the variations of quality in human voice. No agency short of the electron would be quick and docile enough. But with their aid the feat was accomplished, and the electric waves, which acted as the intermediary, could travel a thousand miles or more before being received and once again transmitted. How could the human ear or any instrument follow vibrations of millions a second? It could not. Only the electron could do that. If in addition to the oscillations coming from a distant station, they set up home installations in a small subsidiary vacuum tube of nearly the same frequency, if the incoming waves vibrated a million times, for instance, while their local arrangement vibrated a million plus five hundred, what would happen? They would beat. They would give five hundred beats a second, and that was a musical note. To that they could listen, and upon the variations of intensity could be superposed. That was not the first plan adopted. The first plan was the utilization of crystals and other detectors, such as the Fleming valve, to rectify the oscillation, to check all the negative pulses and utilize all the positive, to let only one sign through. Thus they got the vacuum valve. But soon this was improved by Lee Forrest into a magnifier, so that an original impulse, exceedingly weak, could be strengthened at a hundred or even a thousand times by using the electrons as relays and putting a number of relays in series. So also for transmitting, the magnifying device was available. The electric impulses from the first valve, the one directly actuated by the microphone, need not be given to the ether. They could be used to stimulate another valve so as to increase their intensity until the waves generated were powerful enough to be allowed to rush across the Atlantic. That they were able to do in the fraction of a second. And there, though what arrived was only a feeble residue, 
since they had spread far and wide by that time, yet they preserved all their peculiarities intact. Every pulse of the speech was retained and could be reproduced, and by adequate magnification could be made easily audible. End of section 19